welcome. I'm Todd Anderson, the director of the Live and Cardiovascular Institute, and it's my absolute pleasure on behalf of the Institute and our partners at the University of Calgary and the Faculty of Medicine and Alberta Health Services to welcome you to this very special evening. This evening is to celebrate the 2012 Libin HFMR Prize in Cardiovascular Medicine recipient, and Dr. Eric Topol will be giving the keynote address in a few minutes. The Libin Cardiovascular Institute, for those of you who don't know, has been in existence for about nine years. We are a partnership of the Libin Foundation, the University of Calgary, and Alberta Health Services. And our goal and mandate is really to provide excellence in cardiovascular care delivery, prevention, research, and education. And through our 150 members, we strive to do this on a daily basis. And this is really a key event for us, as you will hear. The Libin uh, lecture uh, for the Libin HFMR Prize was established a number of years ago in honor of the contributions of Mr. Libin, and we're very delighted to have a number of individuals speak with us this evening. So I would like to acknowledge not only Dr. Topol, but Dr. Elizabeth Cannon, who is the President and Vice Chancellor of our University, Dr. Cy Frank, the President of the Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, Dr. John Meddings, our Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dr. Eldon Smith, our Chair of the Strategic Advisory Board of the Libin Institute, and Mr. Libin himself. This prize was set up to honor excellence in cardiovascular research, and we can think of no greater recipient of this, and we're really looking forward to an absolutely spectacular lecture this evening. I'd like to start by introducing uh, President Cannon. Dr. Cannon, for those of you who don't read the newspaper and haven't seen her, she's been the President and Vice Chancellor in Calgary for the last three years and has done an absolutely spectacular job. She's a renowned scientist and engineer with a focus on geomatics and early in her career really published a lot of seminal articles uh, in this area. She became the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and then has been the President and Vice Chancellor for the last few years. She is a renowned scientist, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, which is the highest honor for scientists engineers and artists in our country, and also a member of the Canadian Academy of Engineering. So Dr. Um, is going to come forward. Dr. Cannon will introduce uh, on behalf of the university and say a few words for us. Dr. Cannon. Thank you very much, Todd. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this evening to really a bring greetings on behalf of the University of Calgary and to celebrate the Libin HFMR Prize for Excellence in Cardiovascular Research and to congratulate Dr. Eric Topol for winning this prestigious award this year and welcome back to Calgary. I understand it's been about 15 years. I'd also like to acknowledge our colleagues Cy Frank and John Meddings and Alvin Libin as well as Eldon Smith and many others here who are great supporters of the Libin Institute. I can tell you, when we look at success stories uh, on this campus, the Libin Institute certainly stands out for the quality of work that is done by its faculty members in the clinical care that it offers in our community. I would like to particularly acknowledge Alvin Libin, who has been a friend of our university for many, many years and in partnership with the AHFMR, the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research, allowed this award to be uh, awarded this evening. It is through the visionary leadership of Alvin and Mona Libin and their foundation that this Libin Cardiovascular Institute of Alberta was established. It's a place of discovery and innovation and is not hampered by silos. Really, people work together on interdisciplinary issues in the cardiovascular area, groundbreaking research, which is translated from the lab to the bedside. As a consequence of this visionary leadership, Alberta has an exceptional research enterprise that spans disciplines and institutions and builds on our capacity and the unique partnerships to be able to generate internationally relevant research. Again, the Libin Institute is a stellar example of what makes this happen. I'd like to acknowledge its partners, Alberta Health Services, our own university, and Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. Just for a moment, I'd also like to say that what our university has achieved in a short 47 years is really due to the Libin Institute and its researchers and how they have helped propel this institution forward. Just this past summer, 
in the QS World Rankings of universities around the world under 50 years of age. The University of Calgary in this cohort was ranked number one in Canada, number two in North America, and number 16 in the world. And again, to do that in this time frame against uh, institutions uh, around the world, I think is tremendous, and I would like to uh, acknowledge all the hard work of our faculty help make that happen. So again, uh, welcome this evening, and congratulations, Dr. Topol, and I'm looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Dr. Cannon, thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cy Frank. Dr. Frank is an orthopedic surgeon, clinician scientist, and a fabulous administrator. He was the inaugural founder of the Alberta Bone and Joint Institute that really helped pave the way for innovation in clinical care pathways. He was the inaugural scientific director of the CIHR area that concentrated on bone research. He was the vice president of research in Alberta Health Services, and now he's taken over the helm as the uh, president of the Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. That organization cannot be in better hands from an individual who understands the important role of research and its mix with clinical care delivery. Dr. Frank. Thank you, Todd, and good evening, everyone. Uh, President Cannon, Mr. Libin, uh, the Libin family who are here too, distinguished guests, friends and supporters of the Libin Cardiovascular Institute of Alberta, good evening. It's a pleasure and personal privilege for me to be here tonight for the presentation of the Libin AHFMR Prize for Excellence in Cardiovascular Research that recognizes the highest quality research in this field in the world, something that Alberta, AIHS, and all of those who work in the Institute that bears Mr. Libin's name here in Calgary certainly support. Mr. Libin is well known as a longtime supporter of this principle of world-class excellence from bench to bedside at this university and in our province. And his generosity has helped us catalyze outstanding research in the delivery of effective health services and care in heart health here in Southern Alberta and beyond. His exemplary philanthropy and volunteerism have helped ensure we nurture the best health research in our province. Like the McCaigs, the Hodgkisses, and others, the Snyders and others, the Libbins have been leaders in our community in making things happen. As the board chair of the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research from 1990 to 2000, Mr. Libin led the foundation to create a lasting legacy that ultimately spawned AIHS. The Heritage Foundation paved the way to attract a generation of scientists to Alberta with what I think has been significant impact. Speaking personally, I wouldn't be here without the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> so uh, you'd have about a three minute gap in the program right now. <laughs> <clears throat> Importantly, the Heritage Foundation and its legacy, AIHS, have contributed more than $1 billion from an endowment fund awarded to top health researchers and research in this province, which is uh, part of that legacy, kind of an amazing accomplishment, really. Most importantly for tonight's event, it's important to note that we're here to celebrate Mr. Libin's amazing leadership and contributions and to do that, the Heritage Foundation created the Alvin Libin AHFMR Prize in the Cardiovascular Sciences at the University of Calgary. This wouldn't have happened without generous contributions from his family and friends who were instrumental in making that happen. And I would like to recognize many of those people who are probably in this audience tonight. The intention of this prize is to honor a leading thinker and innovator in the area of cardiovascular research and healthcare. So that prize for research excellence has historically been given to some outstanding individuals. Eugene Braunwald, the distinguished Hersey Professor of Medicine at Harvard, James Willerson, the president of the Texas Heart Institute and University of Texas Health Center, Valentin Fuster, clinician, researcher, author, leader, and director of Mount Sinai Heart in New York, and in 2011, Professor John Cam, the professor of clinical cardiology at St. George's Hospital Medical School, University of London. This year, Dr. Eric Topol joins this list 
of distinguished honorees for his amazing work that he's going to share with us tonight. Dr. Topol is another outstanding choice as a world-class scientist and leader of amazing work in the development of drugs, devices, genomics, and wireless personalized medicine. He's clearly well-deserving of this recognition of the Libin Prize. It's my pleasure now to turn it back to Todd Anderson to more formally introduce Dr. Topol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Topol for the second time today. Dr. Topol is indeed a visionary leader in the field of cardiovascular sciences, probably amongst the top five cardiovascular scientists who have ever been with respect to the breadth of his work. Dr. Topol did training at the University of Rochester, University of California in San Francisco, and John Hopkins University, and very early in his career, established a dominance with respect to applying academia to the growing practice of interventional cardiology. His textbooks sit on my desk, uh, and as a young cardiology uh, angioplasty fellow, had the opportunity to read them. So his initial work was in that area. He then was the leader of large clinical trials that really shaped how we dealt with individuals that came into the hospital with heart attacks, and was the lead author on many of those seminal publications. While at the Cleveland Clinic as the head in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine between 1991 and 2006, over 15 years, and then the formation of the Lerner Medical School associated with the Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic really became the number one place in the world for cardiovascular academia, patient care, and research. And Dr. Topol is largely responsible for attracting the team that made that happen. At a time in one's career where people had been busy he decided to reinvent himself as a geneticist and someone who was interested in the human genome and moved to the Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California. For those of you who have been there, you can imagine that the weather is probably a little better there than in Cleveland. <laughs> Since that time, he's been the director of the Scripps Translational Science Institute and the chief, chief academic officer at Scripps Health, and he holds the Gary and Mary West Chair of Innovative Medicine. And over the last five years, has turned his attention to personalized medicine, how we take the human genome, imaging modalities to apply medicine at a personal level as opposed to a population level. He's really been a leader in using social media to get his message out there and has really become a foremost thinker in this area. Academic, educator, administrator, and scientist, Dr. Topol really epitomizes what this ward is about and we really could not ask for a greater recipient in that. You are going to be absolutely amazed by his talk this evening, and without further ado, Dr. Eric Topol. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very humbled and I'm very appreciative, of course, uh, to President Cannon and uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, Certainly, Todd, that was a great introduction after I gave you such a hard time not being on Twitter uh, earlier today and having just joined because you thought I might intimidate you. Um, I, I've had quite a day here. I've met with so many different uh, people of diverse uh, interests in engineering, uh, genetics, genomics, uh, imaging, of course, cardiovascular. It's been fantastic. It's great to see uh, the buzz uh, and the excitement that's here at the university, the medical school. So. Okay, so the topic tonight is um, medicines Gutenberg, and you're probably wondering what am I going to be talking about? That's kind of far-fetched. And uh, what we're going to get into is how the digital era is going to change uh, medicine irrevocably. It's just a matter of when, not if. But before they do that, and as Todd mentioned about social media, um, I did want to ask uh, about this group how uh, digital you really are. And the way I assess that is how many of you are active on Twitter. Uh, so uh, I'd like to know how many of you are active on Twitter. Okay, uh, I would say that's maybe a, at the best a six or seventh of the group. And I'd like to encourage you to be more active, all of you, because if we all share information uh, that's interesting to us, and uh, we'll all get a lot smarter. So uh, I think that's one message. It's part of the story that we'll get into. So um, this was the 
uh, era that started with the printing press. And uh, I think you may recall that uh, when that happened in 1440, it changed the world. That uh, uh, um, expression, changing the world, is something we use a lot these days, but this really changed the world. You see this is a number of books that were produced uh, each year that went into the millions. Uh, it didn't take very long uh, after this seminal invention occurred. And what I want to submit to you is this was the democratization of information that led to the, uh, not only the Reformation, as pictured here, but also uh, the Renaissance, uh, the, uh, uh, the first Industrial Revolution, and so many other things that occurred as a result of being able to transfer information through the printed word. Uh, extraordinary impact. And so what I'd like to suggest, although it may be a bit bold, and I hope to get you to buy into this, and I'm having a hard time advancing the slides, um, is that while the printing press was back then, in the 1400s, what we have now <laughs> is another invention, unplugged medicine which is basically going to achieve the same thing, analogy to what occurred back so many centuries ago in terms of democratizing medicine and sharing medical information like never before. So uh, the first point is that we can digitize human beings. And pictured on this slide is a geographic information system. You're used to these, of course, through Google Maps, looking at the satellite or the, or the uh, traffic view, the street view. But now we can look at a human being in ways that we could never do before. We have new tools that capture virtually every aspect of a human being, from their social graph, not just social media, but their, uh, all the demographics, including things like uh, health records. Uh, Biosensors, we'll talk a little bit about that. Imaging, uh, obviously that's a major strength here at the university. Uh, genomics, uh, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, uh, the microbiome. Uh, uh, the epigenome, and the exposome, that is our environment. Collectively, all these uh, layers of information define an individual. And we couldn't do that before, but we can do it now. And that's what's so exciting. That's why this is the biggest shakeup in medicine that's imminent. So about digitizing human beings, uh, and what is it really, what are the implications of that? So let's get into that. Uh, there's an old medicine that we practice today. It's based on the population, uh, it's mass screening. It's using the same drugs for uh, patients with the same diagnosis. Uh, it's um, very imprecise and it's very wasteful. But we have a way to go beyond that. And that involves the digital infrastructure that we have, which includes things like broadband uh, connectivity, uh, the, the mobile um, world that we live in today in terms of um, that pervasive connectivity. Uh, but also social networking and a, and a remarkable digital infrastructure in terms of uh, the bandwidth and computing power, supercomputers, cloud computing that it has. Almost unlimited computing power. And at the same time, we have these new tools that I've just touched on through that uh, GIS picture of, of a human being. And that includes uh, uh, not only genomics, but uh, all this information systems, uh, wireless sensors and imaging. And with that, we have this super convergence. We have uh, the different disparate fields like engineering and science and medicine all coming together to set up a convergence the likes of which we've never seen in our civilization. And that sets up with this creative destruction uh, a, a whole new way of going forward in medicine. So that's basically the, uh, uh, the model, if you can accept that. And let's get into some of the more detail. So firstly, the smartphone today is like a pluripotent stem cell. Or another way to look at it, it's well beyond a Swiss army knife. It has so much stuff. And uh, you don't have to carry a lot of other things you used to have to carry because they're all in your smartphone. Well, this is the smartphone of the future. It's the hub of medicine. It's the printing press uh, of the future equivalent. It has a capability for all these things. It will track medication adherence through things like digitized pills or caps on a pill bottle that are, are removed. Uh, it can achieve remote monitoring. It can capture any physiologic metric from a sensor uh, to the phone or to any little device. It has scanning capabilities 
uh, in terms I'll show you. Uh, biosensors, uh, of course, very biosensors. You could do office visits through things like FaceTime and Skype, instead of virtual visits that are secured rather than physical visits, and also includes the capability for environmental monitoring, of a microfluidic attachment for a lab on a chip, and uh, finally, uh, this gateway to this uh, remarkable computing power that we have. So, where does that take us to a patient that is a very different uh, existence than before, this hyper-connected patient, not even pictured adequately through this, uh, but a, a patient who has connected to their own information like never before, because information is flowing directly to the patient. And it's uh, set up all sorts of uh, new technologies like this one. I just mentioned Scanadu because it's kind of catchy, the body hackers, and using sensors to be able to uh, then work with artificial intelligence and come up with predictive analytics before someone gets sick. And this is just uh, one of the many putative tricorders for those Star Trek uh, uh, fans uh, that is a prize going on right now for $10 million for the best uh, tricorder, medical tricorder. So I want to show you an example um, of what a phone can do. As a cardiologist, it became pretty remarkable to me that you could turn your phone into getting an ECG. And so it's pretty simple. These uh, sensors, you just can make a circuit with your heart with a couple of fingers. And you pull up the app. And uh, we'll get a cardiogram in just a second and show you. And uh, let me just uh, put my fingers on the sensor, and I'll show you a cardiogram here in a sec. Actually, come in here. OK. So uh, it just takes a second. And uh, once it settles down, you'll see a pretty high quality rhythm strip. You can see that. I know it's hard to see beyond the front of the room. Um, but it's pretty good. And it's nice to know that I'm still in sinus rhythm. <laughs> With a heart rate of 56, probably need a pacemaker someday. Um, <laughs> Anyway, what's nice about that, of course, is you can then have this little sensor thing, carry it around and, uh, in your wallet or your purse and do a cardiogram at, at, at any time. And you can do all the test sleep. And in fact, it even let me diagnose an anterior wall heart attack on a plane uh, not so long ago by being able to view all the chest leads. And that's where the uh, location of the heart attack was. So that's just an example. I, I give you another example. And by the way, now a patient can get their cardiogram uh, with an algorithm read uh, automatically. And then I can get an email like this happened to me, where the cardiogram uh, was sent to me, this strip, with the title of the email, uh, I'm in atrial fibrillation. Now what do I do? <laughs> um, so you don't need a cardiologist to diagnose rhythm. You can do it right through your smartphone. And as I established uh, this morning, I didn't realize it, but um, uh, it's, it's much cheaper to get a sleep study here at, at uh, Calgary. Um, uh, this hospital is apparently costs eight hundred dollars, whereas in the U.S. it's a minimum of three thousand, ranges up to ten thousand, and you can do a whole sleep study through your phone basically for free. And by the way, I don't know anybody who would want to pay all that money and sleep in a hospital. Um, possibly, possi how could you possibly have a normal sleep pattern? Um, so just by putting your finger here, pulling up the right app, uh, you basically, uh, by taping that and turning off this noise of, the, of your heartbeat, you have a sleep study. Uh, all night you get your oximetry and your pulse, and if you have a sleep apnea episode, uh, you will see a big drop down in your oxygen saturation. So right now, my oxygen saturation's 95, my heart rate is the same as you saw in the cardiogram, 54. And uh, this is a really good way to do a free sleep study. And then you can give the same thing to all your friends and neighbors and post it on Facebook. <laughs> OK. Now, um, I want to show you that the smartphone is bigger than that. I won't even get into the fact it can measure virtually anything, brain waves, vital signs. But I did want to show you it can be made into uh, to do physical exams, virtually any part of the physical exam. So if you take this attachment and you pop it on the smartphone like this, you have a most powerful otoscope you could ever imagine. And then the, the uh, image can be sent to the cloud, tenfold magnified view, and then you could make an algorithm diagnosis of whether there's an ear infection or not. 
And this is, um, I don't know how many of you watched the Colbert Report here. Uh, more than are on Twitter, I see. Okay, <laughs> interesting, uh, interesting. Well, uh, this is uh, examining Colbert's, uh, Stephen Colbert's ear after he had a perforation of his eardrum uh, while he was diving on vacation. so we had to take a few liberties with the, for the content of the presentation here. <laughs> okay, and to top it all off, the next day, two patients actually called my office to try to schedule a smartphone colonoscopy. I'm <laughs> uh, <laughs> kidding, this is amazing, just amazing. Okay, so now let's get into um, the implications. I'm not gonna go through all the censures. Many of you uh, this morning, I went through at least 40 of them to give you a percentage. I'm, not, I'm just gonna cut through that. I'm now going to get into the implications. So now you have this mobile phone and it, it, it's transmitting an immense amount of data. So in the Scientific American, this current issue, there's a picture about the data-driven society. And by the way, we're all going to become even more data-driven. That's what these devices have done to us. It's even going to escalate more. But if you look in this uh, city view and these bubbles about what each mobile device is conveying, here's the data that you can extract, things like the web uh, and phone records demonstrate dissatisfaction with the doctor. Uh, pregnant but doesn't know it yet. Um, you know, uh, the search indicates the coming down with the flu and then another one, activity. These are the kinds of things that you can get from your mobile phone data. So that also brings up the fact that this data could be sold. In fact, w when I was visiting with Colbert and talking about the nanosensor that we can detect heart attacks. He said, well, that will probably be sold to funeral homes with a 25% discount on coffins. I couldn't believe his stuff. <laughs> At any rate, uh, this is, of course, the worry that the data will be used uh, inappropriately and sold without your knowledge, and that obviously has to be dealt with. And there's this issue about privacy, and I thought this really captured it well. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, I've learned today, by the way, that even Edward Snowden could not hack into this university type security system, because I just tried to get onto wireless, and that was a challenge. Um, <laughs> but um, this kind of says it all about the United States, uh, and you probably can be delighted to be uh, up here in Alberta. Uh, da Dad says you're monitoring all our phone calls, and um, Obama says he's not your dad. <laughs> an issue with privacy and we have to deal with that. Okay. Now, let's talk about this information flow. Assuming we can appropriately deal with inappropriate use, exploitation of data, privacy of data, let's say we get that straight. What happens? Well, what happens today is that we have this terrible asymmetry. The patient has a lab test, a scan, uh, offices it, and wants to get their information and they have to beg and grovel to get that information. Uh, and the doctor has all the information, the soothsayer. The patients of the future have the information going directly to their little device or their, you know, their tablet, their phone, and not only that, but it's a lot more information and it's coming to them first. That's a big difference. This is information parity at a much more enriched information level. So today, doctors look down to patients, still today. This is uh, paternalism. This is the doctor knows best that we have still. This is the equivalent to the high priest back in the 1400s. And so this New Yorker article about uh, Mehmet Oz, I won't comment further about <laughs> Dr. Oz, um, but it actually did capture this pretty well. Uh, the, uh, the journalist, Michael Spector, wrote, the era of paternalistic medicine where the doctor knew best and the patient felt lucky to have him or her has ended. And I actually think that's true. And that's part of this medicine, Hindenburg, because who has the information? 
who owns the information. So here I thought we are at the changing of the guard. The guard, the seizing of the data and information is now via the patient, the consumer. And that's really exciting. This is a unique opportunity. This is an inflection point we've never had in medicine. So let's go into some examples. Uh, email. In the United States, uh, still today, uh, the vast majority of physicians refuse to do any email communication with their patients. Uh, there's lots of excuses about that, but in the U.S., the main one is that they don't get reimbursed for that, uh, even though I think it's a fairly modern form of accepted communication. Uh, and furthermore, there's been studies through Kaiser and many other health systems that it's highly efficient, it increases productivity of, of the physicians, and it increases the satisfaction level of patients. But today, in 2012, it hasn't changed much from 33% of U.S. physicians who are willing to email their patients. Now, the next thing is, what about patients getting their notes when they go see the doctor? Office notes. Well, as it turns out, most physicians aren't comfortable in giving them their notes. And when you ask them why, they say, well, I use a lot of acronyms like SOB. And maybe the patient thinks I'm calling them an SOB, and I'm just saying they don't have shortness of breath. So this is, of course, uh, not acceptable because it's the patient's notes. It's about the patient. The patient should own these notes. And so this was a study that was conducted, and published uh, just last year called Open Notes. And basically, it zoomed in on three major centers uh, in Seattle, at Geisinger, Pennsylvania, and in Boston. The doctors didn't believe the patient should get the office notes. But it tested prospectively, and at the end, now it's routine for all the patients to get their office notes. The patients loved it. They weren't confused. They weren't offended. And this is, of course, some uh, good validation of progress. But unfortunately, still today, we have this problem where 70% of doctors polled recently do not believe patients should be entitled to get their own clinic notes, office notes. We have a problem here. And this Accenture survey, which was just done a couple of weeks ago, showed the same problem. That is, what the doctor thinks the patient should get versus what the patient wants is a tremendous chasm here. And that has to change, because this is the right of the patient, and we don't acknowledge that, and we don't respect the patients enough that they are entitled to this. This really boggled my mind. This is a JAMA, one of the leading peer-reviewed journals in medicine. At the title is, should patients have access to their laboratory tests? Help me. It's their laboratory test. And they're asking, should they have access? So that doesn't work too well. Now we have a shakeup in that whole area. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about Theranos. This is happening in the US right now. This is a, a very exciting uh, new development. I just spoke at length to Elizabeth Holmes. She's 29 year old. She's a Stanford dropout who spent the last nine years uh, engineer, uh, working on microfluidics to do a, a blood sample uh, with a, a microliter, just a, like a finger stick amount of blood, uh, to be assay over a thousand common laboratory tests. And so what she uh, was written about in the Wall Street Journal very recently is this uh, remarkable breakthrough. This is the creative destruction of laboratory medicine, uh, of labs uh, around uh, big labs like in the U.S., LabCorp, and uh, uh, and Quest Diagnostics. And uh, by the way, the modern clinical lab emerged in the 1960s and has not fundamentally evolved since then. A quote from that article, that's true about almost all of medicine. Hasn't changed much since the 1960s. It's ripe for a change. So this lab test is basically a finger warmer to make the uh, blood um, uh, um, um, lancet that you can hardly feel a finger warmer, we never even use that. And then this is done uh, in 15 or 20 minutes in the pharmacy. And the first one is in Walgreens, but it's basically signed on to be all Walgreens uh, in the United States, and then I guess soon thereafter the other major drugstore, CVS, uh, Caremark. So this is a pretty big shakeup for the patients to get their own results in their local pharmacy in 15 or 20 minutes at a tenth of the cost with about a 50th of the amount of blood that's normally used. Most of the time you go get a blood sample, most of that blood is completely uh, wasted. That is, it's unnecessary that, that all that blood is taken, but that's been the ritual in medicine. That's one of these sacred cows that we can get beyond. So this is a cartoon about 
it's interpret your own lab test today, uh, but the point is that you're gonna have access, whether it's through your smartphone, which by the way, can measure almost any laboratory test uh, today, whether it's thyroid function tests, not yet commercially available, but soon. This could also be done not even going to a pharmacy. I talked to Elizabeth about that. That's the next advance, where you do any lab test you want through your own smartphone. Just get the kit to do that. Now the next area, uh, that's democratized is, I touched on, is scanning. The number of scans done in the United States is exponentially greater per capita than anywhere else in the world. And part of this is, of course, a lot of ionized radiation, which is thought to be inducing the risk of cancer. Perhaps two or three percent of cancer in the U.S. is thought to due to the excess of medical imaging. And so we need to do something about this to cut down all this un necessary medical imaging. A lot of it is just repeating the same image that was done at another hospital, but not access to the records. If the patient had owned the, the, the scan and the results, that wouldn't happen either. So my, one of my pet peeves is pictured here on this table. We don't tell patients when they go get a, a scan with ionized radiation how much they're going to be exposed to. No one tells the patient. No one measures the ionized radiation. They measure the radiation that the radiation te uh, technicians, the radiologists are, are getting, the cardiologists, but they don't measure about the patient. And the patient is cumulatively, from womb to tomb, getting a lot of radiation, particularly in the US. So why don't we do that? That's part of the rights of patients. And the only uh, center that I'm aware that has changed their ways, is starting to do that, is in uh, Salt Lake City Intermountain Healthcare, where they are now informing the patient when they get sent for a scan, so if you go back for just a second, if you get a nuclear scan of your heart, it's the equivalent of 2,000 chest x-rays. You think patients know that? And most cardiologists in the United States order a nuclear scan every year for their patients. So that's a real problem that has to get fixed, and that's part of democratizing information in medicine. So this captured it quite well, the ultrasound. Uh, that this information uh, can be shared. It should be the patient's will. Um, interestingly, my, my daughter, uh, we're expecting our first uh, grandchild, and she said, I'd like to have a copy of my uh, video of the ultrasound of uh, my baby. And she said, no, we, we don't allow that. So that's not right. That's not right. But uh, certainly, at some places, you can share these immediately uh, as from the scanner uh, to your uh, favorite social network. And while we're on that, I saw this cartoon in the New Yorker yesterday, and uh, this, this caught my eye because this seemed to capture the future data scientists uh, in the womb, as you can see here. Okay, now, uh, talking more about patients' rights, because that's really where, once you digitize things, you decentralize, you disintermediate a lot of the, the, the flow of things today. Uh, then you have these things that crop up, like, for example, this story of Hugo Campos, who had a defibrillator and wanted to see his data of his rhythm abnormality. He's not a doctor, but he felt, this is my defibrillator, and I want to see what, I'm, what in my symptoms, how they connect. And basically, he took on the Medtronic, largest medical device company in the world. And this went on for a couple of years, all sorts of things on Twitter about it. And uh, this was written up uh, in the Wall Street Journal about heart gadgets, test privacy law limits, and ultimately he claimed it was my health information and he won. He won the case, they gave him the data. They said it was against the law, but eventually they succumbed. And that's of course another example, a prime example of what can be achieved uh, when we have the initiative by a consumer, in this case an actual patient. And uh, Medtronic was hiding behind federal rules, rules that prohibit giving patients their data, but that didn't last too, too long. Even kittens want their own data. <laughs> what about people wanting their own data? So that's really, I think, something to consider as we go forward. Now, this one is another thing that drives me nuts, which is the American Medical Association. They uh, say that the citizens of the United States do not have a right to get their DNA data directly. It should go through a doctor or a genetic counselor. So do you know how many genetic counselors there are in the United States for 330 million people? Less than 3,000. So what does that mean? It's through a doctor. And the problem is they did a survey, the AMA did a survey of the physicians, and less than 7% uh, feel any comfort about using genomic data to guide their patients. 
So how could this be to, to uh, deny the right of individuals to have access to their own DNA, it's their DNA? So this is the mantra, nothing about me without me. That's what we want to foster going forward. That's the real advocacy for the consumer, the patient's individual rights. So now we get to the exemplar case. You're familiar with Angelina Jolie's famous case that, that she disclosed back last May. I love the title of her op-ed, My Medical Choice, because it captured everything that she drove. She had a mother who died of ovarian cancer, and she went to her physician thinking, well, maybe I should get checked for this BRCA1, BRCA2, maybe I have uh, hereditary cancer. And her physician said, no, no, that's not enough reason for you to have it. She said, well, I want to have it. I'm going to have it. So she got her blood sent to have BRCA1, 2 gene sequence that came back with a pathogenic mutation in BRCA1, 87% uh, chance of developing breast cancer. She decided on her own initiative, despite uh, the physician's uh, counsel, that she wanted to have a double mastectomy, which she had. She made all the calls. Now, this is an exceptional case because she's such in the public eye. And of course, uh, she's a uh, very much of an outlier with the ability to drive this, but it's really where medicine can go. And it's now being referred to as the Angelina effect. But what's great about it is it brought to the fore, uh, the Angelina effect, the consumer empowered with their own genomic data. She decided to get it, and then she decided to drive a critical medical decision, a major operation. And so the public is now aroused. And do you know how much more BRCA1, 2, for example, has been assayed in people since this, just in the United States alone? It's been an amazing effect. And a lot more people have found out, a lot more women in particular, that they do have um, BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, uh, pathologic mutations. Now, I want to tell you the story about a patient I just saw a couple weeks ago that blew me away. This is Kim Goodsell. I hadn't seen her previously. And uh, she uh, was diagnosed to have a rare cardiovascular disorder with associated. She presented with sudden cardiac death and was resuscitated. And this was uh, 15 years ago. She's now 55. She was resuscitated, and then she ultimately went through a very various tests and was told she had this rare disorder, disorder called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, ARVD. And so she had a defibrillator put in, and she continues a year or two to have to have a defibrillation to save her life. But then, just a few years ago, she was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disorder, and she went to Mayo Clinic, and she was told she had Charcot-Marie Tooth, a very rare disorder. So she started thinking, and she asked the Mayo Clinic neurologist and the cardiologist, this can't be. I don't have any of these diseases in my family tree, and these are really rare. Isn't there something going on here between the two? And both those groups of physicians said, no, you're just very unlucky. Um, <laughs> so what did she do? She spent the next two years researching herself, which wouldn't have been possible before because, for example, the genome wasn't available for public access. And she, what she did was she actually, um, this is her with a Band-Aid patch monitoring her rhythm uh, just to see what it looks like these days. But she then, uh, after two years of research of herself, she found a gene. First of all, she fi found that the right ventricular dysplasia diagnosis was probably wrong because there was no gene associated with it in her, in her uh, sequencing. But then she uh, found a gene that accounted for everything. And it was this gene called Lamin A. And that basically, she went back to the Mayo Clinic and she said, I want, my, I want that gene in me sequenced. And that led to uh, de a definitive pathogenic mutation in that gene that accounted for all her symptoms, both of these rare disorders. And in fact, her neurologic condition has greatly improved by knowledge of the causative gene by the measures that she's taken. So this is a remarkable story. Talk about democratization of information changing a life and initiated by herself. So we don't want to be afraid of our own DNA. We want to promote uh, public access to it. Not everybody's going to spend two years researching their own genome. But a lot of the medical profession thinks that patients can't handle their genomic data, that they'll go wacko or get depressed or have terrible anxiety. We did a study published in the New England Journal that showed, in fact, patients do beautifully learning all about their genome scan, which are all the common variants. There wasn't any sign 
of heightened anxiety that was durable or depression or anything else. So people can handle having their own information. And that's been uh, re repeated many other times since then. This is with BRCA, with women who discovered their BRCA mutation through the 23andMe kit, the starter kit, if you will, for genomic information. It only looks at a couple of common mutations in the BRCA gene. And then NPR did a survey, and you can say that NPR is not representative of the public. I understand that. Uh, but this uh, survey is interesting because most people would want to get their genome sequence if they could afford it, 81 plus percent, and uh, they want all the information, all the information, 73 percent. So most of the public wants to get the information, but most of the physicians don't want them to get the information. So we had this medical per perception of DNA testing. That's what it looks like. This truck that goes around and checking for paternity. That's what the medical profession would like to make. In fact, when I spoke with the AMA, because they're so upset with me about this view that all people are entitled to their DNA, they said, well, it's all a lot of junk information. Basically, this, this picture is what they tried to portray. Well, I just want to share with you. I've had my genome sequence. I have it on my iPad. And uh, it's actually pretty darn remarkable. Any, every week I can look up the, whatever the new discovery is and try to factor in where I uh, stand. And I just want to show you uh, my genome, just a couple of things. Here's the chromosomes. You can zoom in on any particular nucleotide in any position of any chromosome. So that's uh, six billion letters where you can zoom in on your iPad. So I decided I'm going to find out about my Alzheimer's disease risk. That was a mistake. Um, <laughs> So I looked up all the genes known to be associated with Alzheimer's, which are provided on the app, which cost 99 cents. And uh, I found uh, I had, um, here you see a couple of different variants. Here's, a, uh, uh, here's one and a uh, second one. And I said, oh, well, first one, I have a fourfold risk of Alzheimer's for this particular gene, this APOC1. And then the second one, I had a 2.94 increased risk, independently increased risk, for Alzheimer's. So that made me think that if I go blotto here this evening with you, you'll know exactly the reason, full disclosure. Um, but what you can do once you have this on your iPad, and someday most people will have their genome se fully sequenced on their own tablet or device, or look it up on a, a server. You then have a, a window to, to hyperlink to all the information. You know, if, if Kim Goodsell had had this, it would have markedly expedited her uh, discovery of the gene that caused her two rare conditions. And so you can look up everything, all the papers, and you can try to put this in context. Of course, it's much easier if you have a background to interpret this information, but it's, uh, this can be very helpful to anyone uh, delving into information. You can get your gut microbiome samples. And in fact, a special with your significant other, two, two for uh, $180. I know some people that are getting their gut microbiome sampled uh, every week or two. And these people are a little kooky, but um, it's very interesting because a lot of information there. We talk about those layers, the GIS of human beings. A lot of information there that talks about predisposition to obesity, to diabetes, to autoimmune diseases, cancer. In fact, you probably saw just a couple weeks ago the study that if you take obese people and you take their fecal transplant and put it into lean mice, you can make the mi mice fat. So that tells you about the power of what's going on in the microbiome. Now cancer is a genomic disease, and MD Anderson uh, is one of the leading cancer centers around the, uh, North America, and they have these ads like this, which are pretty strong about our goal and cancer. I think everybody's goal is to end cancer, but they like to claim that, uh, MD Anderson. Uh, well, the point is this just uh, uh, on Sunday, uh, this was published in Nature Genetics. This is the GIS of cancer. We can now do uh, every omic of a tumor specimen and compare it to the native germline DNA of the individual, and we can find out what went off the tracks. And whether it's RNA-seq or the sequence or, or the proteomics, it's remarkable. Then we could find the pathway of what caused the cancer, which is really remarkable in any individual. And it's not that expensive when you consider the cost of the drugs. So this uh, particular cartoon recently uh, tried to focus less on a cure and more on a treatment you can afford. <laughs> this, is a, uh, you know, th this is a very sobering cartoon. 
because that's where we're headed if we don't get smarter about how we practice medicine and we don't use the information that's obtainable. So in cancer, that means last year in 2012, there were 12 new cancer drugs, all, almost all genomically guided drugs. 11 of them cost more than $100,000 per treatment. If we don't use these intelligently, we're wasting a lot of money. Moreover, the patient's cancer could progress while we're misfiring with the wrong drug for the wrong pathway and mutation. Now, what really gets me, again, drives me nuts about lack of insight to the consumer interest and the potential today is what I call the F word in cancer. You know what happens when you take a tumor specimen from someone from surgery uh, or uh, from biopsy, where it goes? Anybody? Where does it, what's the next step once you have that specimen? It's dropped in formaldehyde. That's the first F. Uh, formaldehyde fixed and then paraffin embedded, wax. Formaldehyde, wax. what do you think that does to the ability to do sequencing? No less anything else. Do patients know that when they do, when they have surgery or a biopsy? No, but if they demand and say, I want to have some of that frozen, and then it's preserved for all this type of analysis. But pathologists don't want to do that because that gets a um, uh, need for freezers, they're not reimbursed for it, every other excuse you can possibly think of. They want to have it proven. Well, this is pretty obvious that this could be a big deal if we start to have paired specimens, some the old way, some the new way. So we'd like to have fresh frozen, which gives us the ability to define the root cause of each person's cancer, which is, of course, unique and distinct. So we wrote an editorial uh, in JAMA about rebooting how we process cancer specimens. You know what, are there any pathologists here this evening? Uh, but they didn't like it too much, uh, I can tell you. Uh, but the other thing about cancer is we have these cancer centers that are all now sequencing, the ones that are doing it with fresh frozen tissue, and they're not pooling any of that information. And that's really unfortunate. And we'd like to tear the walls down. They call it an arms race in the New York Times front page. So what we like to see happen, you know the creative destruction of education is a massive open online courses, curriculum. And the creative destruction of medicine is about massive open online medicine. So if you bear with me here, what we're talking about is you have a diagnosis of cancer, you get sequenced and all these omics, you then have a database of the planet, ideally, which has every cancer individual, demographic, social graph, treatments, outcomes, sequence, everything. Then you can find a precise match to find out how you would likely uh, do well with your treatment. That's what a MOOM could do just in cancer, no less in other areas. So what is exciting to see that in the Wall Street Journal recently, like uh, a week or so ago, there was patient shared DNA for cures. Doesn't that sound good? Uh, and that, of course, is exciting because this particular, this is with the Oregon Health Science University, uh, the Lymphoma Leukemia Society has given millions of dollars to share the sequencing data for people with liquid tumors so that the future individuals could benefit by setting up a moon. They didn't call it a moon, but a health information system working with a sequencing company and with an information company, Intel. There are 400,000 people now who've had their genome scanned and in 23andMe, which has cost $99, is setting up a powerful database for common variants. Not sequence, it's just a tiny ice pick view, like I called it a starter kit, but it really is a nice big database of common variants, and that's another exciting advance. This idea about a cohort of public health needs to be turned over to the public. That's all part of the theme here. And so I wanted to show you one other sensor, which is a precursor. Uh, to where sensors will go about uh, managed competition in the public. Sleep tracking, does anybody do sleep tracking here? A few people? Okay, not too many. Well, there's lots of ways to do it, and the one I thought was particularly good was this ZO because it measured brain waves. The other ones just measure movement, which I think is somewhat imprecise. So this is a headband that has three sensors on it. On the forehead you wear, uh, it's now the company went bankrupt. I think it was a little ahead of its time or something. And people didn't like to wear the headband. But at any rate, uh, I liked it because then I got all my sleep data and it went right to my phone. I could send it to my office staff and they'd know not to mess with me in the morning. <laughs> be a total grump. It also goes to the, to the nightstand and you see every minute of sleep. 
And so uh, here's my sleep uh, graph for one night, and I uh, tend to go to bed early. My wife is a night owl, and she can look at the clock, and she can see uh, orange is awake, gray is light sleep, deep sleep, uh, gr dark green, uh, and REM sleep, you know, that's uh, phase three. You see it all there. She goes in the room, she looks at the clock, and she says, Eric, I know you're awake, and I want to talk. <laughs> um, now, it's like true serum, and you can't play possum with this. <laughs> okay, now, why did I bring this up? Not just, of course, I wanted to get you to uh, find some humor in it, but now we have managed competition because now you can do a sleep off. I can do, with 10,000 people, I can find out how I sleep relative to people in my age group. Or you can do it with your social network, your neighborhood, your family. You can have sleep competitions, who's the best quality sleeper? <laughs> and every single metric. Now, think about that with blood pressure or glucose or things that really matter. That's where we're headed. That's what's democratization of each person's data, what they want to do with it. And uh, by the way, this is big in athletes right now, athletic performance. So um, it's not just triathletes, but also NFL, several teams, NBA uh, have used this every night. And interestingly, the uh, Olympic bicycling team, women's bicycling team that got the silver medal in London, they attributed uh, sensing sensors of, for their sleep tracking as how they improve their athletic performance. And now even the pro athletes are into this. And this is a compilation of the pro athletes. The actually, interestingly, the pro athlete with the, the king of sleep is none other than uh, King LeBron James, uh, who averages 12 hours of sleep a night. And what's also interesting is the pro athlete with the absolute least sleep is Tiger Woods, and I won't comment any further on that. <laughs> We're talking about data-driven society, right? Um, so we're not even talking about shared decision, which was the way we, today, we characterize a doctor sharing the decision with the patient, getting them informed. We're talking about a new thing called shared decision. Do I want my data to go to my doctor, or I just want to keep it to myself? Who do I want it? Because I have control. That's where we're headed. It's really remarkable. So now we're starting to see emergence of citizen scientists like Kim Goodsell. She was working on herself, but now it's a whole new movement because people have access to this data. Uh, and so you have, for example, this fellow who started a trial uh, in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis uh, concocting his own drug and also um, testing this with other patients. Now this can be dangerous, but this, of course, was done under really tight uh, guidance and supervision. And the whole idea of rethinking clinical trials from a patient point of view, with all this data, granular data on each individual. There's even an editorial recently in the New England Journal towards patient-centered drug development. What do the patients want? Isn't that nice to see? It's never been thought before. Uh, and we now have the idea of using social networks to bring in patients to do trials quickly, cheaply. That's a whole new idea we never had before because we didn't have these social networks to recruit patients and get informed consent through the web. That's exciting. So I wanted to show you this morph video. Uh, you remember this movie, Jerry Maguire, 1996? And I uh, take on the voice of Tom Cruise. And one of my colleagues uh, at Scripps, uh, Dan Juma Quarles, takes on Cuba Gooding. So if you can indulge me for just a minute or two here, uh, here's a morph of that. A uh, clip. Are you ready, Jerry? I want to make sure you're ready. Brother, here it is. Show me the Okay, all right, now, 
just to pull things together, what about the doctor in all this? Like Norman Rockwell here, 1950s, uh, the doctor with the boy, the thermometer. You see the boy's arm around the doctor, and they're looking at data, and they're sharing the data. Isn't that nice when you can do, when you can share the data with the patient? That's the way it ought to be. When you do the ultrasound with the patient and show to the patient, instead of they have to beg and grovel to see the information. So this is the analog doctor, uh, the metaphor of the analog doctor, because the analog doctor is not going to survive. And uh, we have uh, uh, a digital doctor breeding zone right now. And in fact, even the New York Times, uh, the medicine that will never be the same, transforming medicine in virtually every way, that's right, that's true. We have this article talking about the evolution of the master diagnostician. Well, that's completely off, because the master diagnostician is the ultimate digital doctor that leverages all this information and works as a partner with the patient, providing guidance, uh, wisdom, uh, as well as empathy and the human factor. And so that's really a whole different model. So this doctor of the future, this digital doctor, is a very different look. Now, this particular venture capitalist, well known in California, you know, COSA, has said that 80% of doctors will be unnecessary. That's way out of bounds, I think, but a whole different look of how the doctor will function uh, is going forward. Then this word, doctor, uh, comes from to teach but we haven't been doing that enough. And hopefully in the future, that's what that, the derivation of the word doctor will indeed be the case. So this is an era of the blockbuster of patient engagement. It's really exciting. Patients are not going to be just engaged and connected, but they're going to be emancipated with respect to their data uh, accessibility. And this whole idea about patient activation, the blockbuster drug, that's really uh, very exciting. So, you know, the finance industry allowed people to take over with electronic, digital, their bank accounts, but not in medicine so far. Uh, we even have self-serve gas stations. Can you imagine what it was like before you had to rely on someone else uh, uh, filling up your gas tank? Uh, we won't even have someday gas tanks, but uh, this is, of course, a whole different look for people to be self-serving, uh, do it yourself, if you will, in terms of having information. And then finally, about this uh, taking charge of health, these stethoscopes, which are, by the way, an obsolete device, no longer necessary in medicine, but still the icon of medicine. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, the whole idea without doctors. So I'll leave you with a couple of points, and that is this uh, British Medical Journal editorial, Let the Patient Revolution Begin. That's what medicine's Gutenberg era is all about, and it's now attainable for the first time. And so when you can digitize human beings, you then set up the lack of need, for the most part, of hospitals, except for intensive care units, operating rooms, procedure rooms. Uh, you have no need for face-to-face, -face, uh, that is, physical visits. You, a lot of this can be done virtually. You, medications can be much more precise and get rid of waste. We can have a different remodeled uh, doctor-patient relationship, and we certainly can do far better with disease management and prevention. So the, the other exciting thing is when you have all this granular individualized data, you then have this whole moon concept. And that's remarkably powerful going forward, uh, democratizing medicine. So the future really is here now. Uh, hopefully uh, you can buy into that. I look forward to your comments. I think it's exceptionally bright in a time when we need to innovate out of an economic health care crisis. And I uh, just want to acknowledge uh, so many of my colleagues back at Scripps for all uh, their support and the work that uh, some of which I discussed with you. Thanks very much for your attention.